welcome to the second presentation of the Presidential Lecture Series 2004-2005. This, this lecture today is featuring the School of Liberal Arts and Education. My name is Professor Jimmy Jenkins. I'm from the Department of Mass Communication, Creative and Performing Arts and Speech, and I'm also the coordinator. First off, we'll start off with moments of reflection by Professor Amir al Islam. Good evening. I want to take this opportunity to share something with you this evening. For just a few moments, I just would like to have us reflect on something. And for the reflections today, I thought it would be appropriate to talk about a personality that spoke to me in some of his poems and some of his music. And I thought it would be appropriate today in terms of having us reflect. And that is Tupac Shakur. In one of his poems, Tupac says something that was so profound to me and revealing to me. In his book of poems, The Rose That Grew From the Concrete, he talked about his address to America. And he says to America, when you see me, all you see is concrete. You don't see the rose that grew out of the concrete. It is such a profound metaphor for the vision and the interpretation of those people who oppress people of color. To look at people of color and see nothing but problems and pathologies and his metaphor, concrete. And they do not see the mastery and the beauty of a rose that grows out of this concrete. And when I come and before you today and when I go to my class and when I'm at Meg Rivers College, I say to you, that I see nothing but roses. In all of you, all I see are roses. I don't see concrete. I see nothing but beauty, nothing but potential, nothing but future leadership, nothing but outstanding individuals. Yet we must acknowledge the, the reality of concrete. And when I say concrete, what I really mean is fragmented families broken relationships, inadequate schools, failed institutions, racism and discrimination, all of the obstacles that you have faced, all of the obstacles that try to keep you down and keep us down, that you, in fact, rose above it and blossomed like a beautiful rose, like a flower coming out of concrete. This is such a profound concept. The second thing that I want, and final thing that I want to refer, reflect, you to reflect on is something else that Tupac said. He said, I didn't invent thug life. And any of you know about Tupac, you know he was a thug, right? He said, I didn't invent thug life. He said, but possibly, or maybe if I were to talk about it and articulate it, then there's a possibility that someone will do something about it. So I'm saying this to you, 
And I'm celebrating some of the positive things that Tupac said. As you know, he said some things that I have a grave disagreements with in terms of his rap. But I celebrate those things that he says that was positive. And he wanted us to understand the reality that if you and I don't do something about the reality that is happening in our communities, then they will never change. So he is saying he did not invent this life, but he is calling upon someone to do something about it. When we are, as a people, people of African ancestry, are facing the reality that 60, 75 percent in some places, like in New Jersey and other places, 85 percent of the inmates in the, in the criminal justice system, in the penal institutions, are people of color. There are more African American males in jail than there are in college. And it is cheaper to send an African American male to Yale than it is to send them to prison. This second, the first, uh, the number one cause of death among African Americans between the ages of 20 and 30 is HIV AIDS. Think about that. The third is suicide. And after that, what we call, or what they call, black on black violence, street violence. So we are taking a page out of Tupac's book and saying, we are going to do whatever we can to change the condition of a people who are suffering dis disenfranchisement and suffering oppression. And we're going to do everything that we can to change that condition. And we're going to thrive even though we have all types of concrete around us. Thank you very much. In the sanctuary of learning, minds and space merge in a tranquil setting. Glass, air, light, and space for intellects to grow that blossom seeds of knowledge, unfolding in a contemplative world of books, reading, and information, sturdy, steady, and strong, creating success one student at a time. Maker Evers College, come. through math and science, you'll never see anything the same way again. Go to girlsgotech.org. You'll see. In the 1930s and in the 1940s, African American men and women who were dedicated to assuring that the truth about black folk was told were held in high esteem by their communities and were referred to as race men and race women. Dr. Carlisle Van Thompson, a Woodrow Wilson Mello, Mellon Fellow in the Humanities and a distinguished graduate of the City College of the City University of New York and Columbia University, is an associate professor of African American and American literature at Medgar Evers College in the Department of Languages, Literature, and Philosophy where he serves as the chairperson. Dr. Thompson teaches composition and literature, especially in the areas of African American literature, from the slave narratives to the present, and American literature from the colonial period to the present. More specifically, his research areas continue to be the literature of the Harlem Renaissance and the phenomena of light-skinned individuals uh, individual blacks passing for white, along with lynching, racial violence, and sexual violence in the works of John Oliver Killens, Richard Wright, Toni Morrison, Chester Himes, and Gail Jones. Dr. Thompson's book, The Tragic Black Buck, Racial Masquerading in the American Literary Imagination, examines the theme of passing, passing for white, 
in the works of Charles Waddell Chestnut, James Weldon Johnson, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and William Faulkner. This work was recently published by Peter Lang Publishers in May of this year. In his essay, Making Something Out of Nothing, The Dangerous Business of Masquerade and Nella Larson's Passing, will be published in Women in Performance in November 2005. Dr. Thompson is currently working on his second book of criticism entitled Miscegenation as Sexual Consumption in African American Literature. In the introduction to his work, The Tragic Buck, Dr. Thompson notes in the last paragraph, my enduring concern in this literary project is the cultural construction and representation of race. Ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, I present to you this 2004 style race man, Dr. Carlisle Van Thompson. My talk is entitled, A Double Articulation, Afro-American Literature and the Journey to in Intellectual Empowerment. Now, before I begin, I want to thank President Jackson for the honor of giving this lecture as you see in your program, the host of individuals who have given this lecture, because we know it, it does a number of things. The people who give this lecture share, inspire, and motivate those of you who are on your journey to intellectual empowerment. President Jackson has been a strong supporter of me and my work, and I thank him for this opportunity. Now, as Dr. Nunez said, I might not have been here had he not approached me at Baruch and asked me to apply. And since I've been here, Dr. Nunez has been a great supporter and mentor of me and my work. She's read my essays, she's given me guidance, and I thank her for that. I also want to thank the, Jimmy Jenkins and Glenn McMillan for their support and working with me to put this event together. I also like to give honor to Linda Jackson, a friend and colleague who has just made my tenure at Megger uh, more relaxed more fun, and more provocative in terms of the ideas that I have shared with her. And I think, I, in some ways, I think I have encouraged her as well. To my colleagues in the Department of Literature, Languages, and Philosophy, I thank you for your presence, especially Dr. Susan Fisher, who serves as the Deputy Chair of our department who makes my life a lot easier because she used to be a chair somewhere else. To the students, and especially those who are our English majors, I thank you for your presence here. Um, you have listened to my ideas and uh, in my classes, and uh, I've seen you grow and develop, and I'm quite proud of you. And in general, to the students here, especially those students in the freshman year program. I really hope you understand the importance and significance of this institution and the journey that you're on. And I truly believe that we as faculty have a critical role to play in your journey to your intellectual empowerment. Years after leaving uh, Brooklyn Tech, uh, that's the high school I went to, I used to uh, work at a nonprofit institution called the African Poetry Theater. And at the same time I was working at the African Poetry Theater, I was volunteering, I was working for the New York City Transit Authority. Just kind of tell you about this journey. And working at the African Poetry Theater, I was able to meet 
some phenomenal intellectuals. And here I'm talking about people that Dr. Nunes has just mentioned, Gwendolyn Brooks, Barbara Sizemore, Mary Baraka. And what struck me about these individuals is that they were, even though they were involved in the community, they were involved in institutions, mainly colleges. And it struck me that maybe I should go back to school. And essentially that's what I did. I went back to City College while working, because I know many of you work, and I worked full time. Full time working for the Transit Authority and a full time student. And as Dr. Nunez mentioned, I was quite successful and graduated with a 4.0 index, valedictorian, Woodrow Wilson Fellowship in the Humanities. Thank you. Now, that Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, there's a story to that because it's very competitive. You're competing in your area. I was in the Eastern region. So I was competing with people in New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Jersey. And you apply and you fill out all these documents. And then if you're successful, you're invited to an interview, which is the final piece of that decision on whether you get this fellowship. And so I remember the day very, very distinctly as I was leaving my house, going down to Hunter College to the president's suite for this interview. And while I was leaving my house, my TV was on and Nelson Mandela was being released from Robben Island the day I had my interview, very poignant day. And I was a little upset not because he was being released, it's because I was upset at what the commentator was saying. The commentator said that these people have been waiting all this time for Nelson Mandela to be released. No, that's not it. They were waiting for their turn to take back and have control of their own destinies. Nelson Mandela was part of that. But the real question was about the land and resources and who was going to be leading this country in a democratic way. So I kind of walked down to that interview or went to that interview with that kind of burden hanging over me. I wasn't too pleased with that situation. But when I got to the president's office, a guy was coming out and he just had his interview and he came out sweating, sweating, and said that was the hardest thing he ever did. You know, the first thing I did, I did not internalize that. And I said to myself, that will not be my experience. And I walked in and, you know, properly dressed. I had a leather bag. I had a book by my mentor, Haki Mabuti. Had a piece of kente cloth. And I walked into the room, I put the things on a chair behind where I was going to sit. And I sat down, introduced or said hello to everyone in the room. And then I began to think, all right, who's got the power in this room? And generally you think the person right across from you is in the power position. But that didn't turn out to be true. The person who was sitting across from me in terms of the power position was there because of his relationship to Hunter Collins. But the power position was here. And that's where the first question came. And this gentleman asked me a question about my personal statement. He says, I see you teach this Chinese mathematics. And I waited and I took a deep breath. Because that's the first thing, you start breathing. Don't respond immediately. And I said, um, it's not Chinese mathematics. Because he, when he asked the question, he was kind of aggressive leaning forward, and I corrected him, said, no, it's Korean mathematics. You see, I didn't state in my personal statement whether it was Korean or Chinese. Based on the name Chisholm he made an assumption that it was, in fact, Chinese. Now, when I corrected him, he took a more relaxed posture and leaned back. Power became right here. 
and everyone in the room sensed the shift in power. Now, the interview went quite well, and at the end, I walked around and shook everyone's hand. But the chairman did something interesting. He didn't initially shake my hand. What he did was, he went over to that chair, he got my leather bag, my kente cloth, and my book, and he presented it to me, and then he shook my hand. I left that room knowing I had a Mellon Fellowship in the humanities. And a few days later, the letter came stating that I could go to any college in the United States, graduate school, and my tuition, tuition books, and stipend will be paid by the Mellon Fellowship. Along with the last year, $15,000 just to write my dissertation. So what I'm trying to suggest is there was a, perhaps a spiritual element there in terms of thinking about Nelson Mandela, bringing my mentor's presence into that room, and bringing the experience and knowledge that I got from many professors in the CUNY system. Now, there's a quote that I want to give you that's kind of going to frame my discussion of this literature. The quote is by William Faulkner, and I'll repeat it if necessary. It states, memory believes before knowing remembers, believes longer than recollection, longer than knowing even wonders. Let me repeat that. The quote from William Faulkner states, memory believes before knowing remembers, believes longer than recollection, longer than knowing even remembers. Now, my analysis of that quote is that our racial and psychic memories are even intact before knowledge is firmly in place. Let me give you an example. Was out, when I was at Brooklyn Tech, I was in a, uh, a history course, and I had a teacher who said that there's no evidence that black people did anything significant in this country. That's what this student teacher said to me, or said to our class. Now, I said to myself, even though I didn't really have the concise information, I said, I don't believe that. That does not work. I'm not hearing that. I didn't believe that. Clearly now, I have the information to poignantly uh, contest that statement. But that wasn't that long ago, 1970s. High school student, high school teacher saying that to a class, in a history class, quite disturbing. That black people did nothing of any significance. Now, obviously, I have problems with that, but there's clearly for me, that issue of memory. Because when I think about how I got to this place, it's literacy. Now, some of you maybe remember them. I grew up reading the Hardy Boys. Nancy Drew, can I get a witness on that? Yeah. All right. That's what I read as a young man. And I had collections of it most of all the serials, but the key issue was I love to read. My reading changed because at some point the Hardy Boys weren't speaking to me anymore and Nancy Drew wasn't speaking to me anymore in terms of culture and the realities of being a young black 
male in the society in terms of the Black Panthers, in terms of Attica, in terms of the, the legacy of the Civil Rights Movement, I began to read different things. And I began to look for myself in these texts. So I began to read other things, like James Weldon Johnson, like Malcolm X, and study history. And not just American history, but what was happening in the world. And so when I think about the success at City College, the key issue was reading. That I loved to read, and I was able to do it quickly. In fact, there was one semester where I had to take 20 credits each semester. And some of you may be able to testify to that while working. And one experience I had, I remember the class, and I remember the professor, Leo Hamelian, and we were reading D.H. Lawrence. And that was the first text that we read, and the first paper. And so I did something that I can be truthful here, that uh, most students didn't do. We saw a film on D.H. Lawrence. Now, when the class was over, the professor left. But you know what I did? I took the tape. Oh, I borrowed the tape. Took the tape home, watched it as I was working on my paper, and brought the tape back, right? And I presented my first paper. That professor said something to me that was quite uh, interesting to me. He said, uh, after he read the papers, he said to the class, not to me specifically, he said to the class, he said, class, after he read my paper, I didn't know he was going to do that. He said, this is the type of paper all of you in the class should attempt to emulate. And he said, uh, Mr. Thompson, as far as I'm concerned, you don't have to do any more writing in this class. I was very pleased. I was taking 20 credits. Not having to do any more writing in his class would be a relief. And I did, because I had enough to do. All right. But it shows you that there's strategies that you need to employ in terms of learning. There's certain strategies that you should employ. And take risks. That was a risk, and it worked out. Now, Dr. Nunes has talked about some of the mentors I had. One of the mentors I want to mention and, and two experiences I want to mention in terms of at Columbia. When I was taking my orals at Columbia, and that's where after you read a lot of areas of literature, you have to sit down with four professors and they grill you over what you read. Before my interview started, I was sitting there and a professor who I did not know and had never taken a course with came into that room and placed a cup of water right in front of me and walked out. And I'm saying, what's going on here? I don't know that guy. Why did he do that? But of course, I wasn't really fixated at the, at the time. I was more thinking about the orals. So I, as I think about it now, it wasn't about giving me some water. It was that he was sending a message to those other professors. He was a senior professor at Columbia. And he just walked in and placed some water in front of me and walked out. Now, one thing I, I realized after I got to Mega, and this happened before, that Dr. Betty Shabazz was a good friend of mine before I came here. And I never told anyone that. I never put her name down on my, on my CV. I don't think, I never told that to Dr. Nunes, that de Dr. Betty Shabazz was a good friend of mine. But you know what? I found out later, Dr. Betty Shabazz was on the board of trustees at Columbia University. And I found out later that she would have asked the president of Columbia, how's my little brother doing? She was talking to me, you know, she, I was young, and she would ask about me. I found out about that later. I didn't know about that at the time. She never said anything to me about that. She would just call me and say, how you doing? How's your studying going? But so it's interesting how people can mentor you 
and look after you, and you don't even know it. Egypt, land of the pharaohs and magnificent splendor. Join Dr. Crawford's annual educational tour to Egypt from July 23rd to August 6, 2005. This trip includes a five-star luxury cruise up the Nile, luxury hotels, and shopping. Visit the Pyramid, Sphinx, the temples at Abu Simbel, Karnak, Luxor, Valley of the Kings, and much more. For more information, call 718-756-8904 or visit www.sancopaworldpublishers.com. <laughs> You don't need to be bigger than life to be a good dad. You just need to spend time with your kids. It takes a man to be a dad. One more experience at Columbia that was profound. When I decided to do my dissertation on racial passing, the year that I had passed my orals and was looking for a mentor, someone to be my dissertation advisor, Columbia hired a black man from Barnard, Robert O'Mealy. And the first course, graduate course that he taught was on racial passing. That's beyond coincidence. My dissertation is in this area. This professor comes, the first graduate course that he teaches is in my area. He became my dissertation advisor and my mentor. Now, I want to talk about my journey here at Megger. When I first came here, it was an arduous first year, because you, as an instructor, you teach more, and you're still trying to finish, because I came here before I finished my dissertation. So it was arduous, and learning the culture, learning how to teach, because even though you have this degree, you still got to learn how to teach. And even if I taught at Columbia, I still needed to know how to teach at Megger. It's not the same. It's not even now, if I went somewhere else, I would learn, I have to learn how to teach at that institution. So I, have to, I had to learn. And students here taught me, in some ways, how to teach, how to be more responsive to what they needed to know and learn. Now, My dissertation, obviously, uh, as Dr. Newton stated, is on racial passing. And as I was trying to turn it into a major publication, and essentially at some point I have done that, something happened to kind of throw me off a little. Because I was working on this chapter on F. Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby, which I'll talk about soon. Something happened to kind of throw me off. And what, I, what happened was, what happened to Abner Louima? You remember Abner Louima? As I'm working on this, I'm hearing about what happened to Abner Louima. And it was so bizarre and upsetting to me that I said, no, I got to leave this work alone for a minute. And I got to think about this. And I got to think about it, and I got to do something about this. And so I began to investigate, research, and to begin to write about what happened to Abdul Louima. And interesting in terms of writing, the conclusion came first. And the conclusion to me with regard to that case was that some, and I mentioned some, some white male police officers are a pain in the butt. That's what I came to. That was my conclusion. And I said, well, if I'm going to write this essay, how am I going to get to that conclusion? And so I did all this research. And what I argue in that essay on Abner Louima, and you have the, the full title in your brochure, 
is that this was not simple a case of racial violence. It was about also sexual desire. And if we look at the history of African Americans, not just here, we see it in the Caribbean. We, if we look at Michelle Cliff's novel, A Binge, we see it there too. It's not simply about hatred. It's not that simple. It's about desire as well. And in my first, in all my classes, my students who are here know that the first text I teach in all of my classes is a novel, or I'm, I'm sorry, a poem, Between the World and Me by Richard Wright. And this poem is a rather surreal poem about a lynching, a black man being lynched, where the narrator stumbles upon this thing and he describes it, and this thing could be essentially the scene of the lynching and the aftermath of the lynching. And why I use this poem, and it helps me think about what happened to Abner Louima, that the poem is so surreal and such a brilliant poem. And there's a couple lines that I want to mention about this poem. And the line states, well, what happened was there's a lynching. This black man is tied to the sapling. He's tortured. He's beaten. Eventually, he's burned alive before, after, before he's castrated as well. There's a line in this poem. It says, quote, there was a charred stump of a sapling point a blunt finger accusingly at the sky. And the other line, some of the other lines read, quote, and a thousand faces swirled around me clamoring that my life be burned and then they had me, stripped me, battered my teeth into my throat to swallow my own blood. My voice was drowned in the roar of their voices, and my black, wet body slipped and rolled in their hands as they bound me to the sapling. Now I want to go back to that first line I just talked about. There was a charred stump of a sapling point of blunt finger accusing at the sky. And I asked my students, you know, what's, what is Wright trying to suggest here in this poem? And those who know literature say, well, all right, Dr. Thompson, that's personification because, you know, the sapling is pointing. I say, that's good. Now, is there any signification going on? Is he signifying on anything? And at some point they say, well, he's pointing accusingly at the sky. That means he is challenging God, the creator, and asking God, why did this have to happen? Why was this man killed? Why was his sapling burned? I said, that's very good. All right. So, and I try to help them. I said, well, let's put this together. And what do we get? What do we get is right doing this kind of sophisticated, signifying personification and intertextuality in terms of the poem and the Bible, constructing an analogy between human life and nature, a symbiotic relationship, right? With a double articulation of the evil associated with the desecration of human life and nature. You got that? Let me say it again. And I'll read it to you where I got it. What Wright is doing through that line, we get signifying personification and intertextuality that constructs an analogy between the symbiotic relationship between human life and nature with a double articulation of the evil connected to the desolation of human life and nature. Because both human life and nature is assaulted, assaulted in this act of racism and prejudice, right? And if we think about some of the evil in the world, it's not just about what's happening to humans, it's also what's happening to the earth. 
And why is that important? That double articulation. It should be, it's important because of Megar. If we consider the life and work, for, work of Megar Evers, they represent a double articulation. As a college graduate with a BA degree, Megar Evers challenged segregation by applying and being denied admission to the University of Mississippi Law School. This denial led him to being appointed to America's first field secretary to the NAACP. Hence, Megan was not just satisfied with having a good life for himself and his family. No. He wanted to fight the injustices in the society with regard to the integra integration of public facilities, schools, and restaurants. And like a train barreling down a track, he organized voter registration drives and demonstrations. Like a knight wrapped in the majestic armor of grace and integrity, Megar took the field. He arrived when many blacks were suffering the despair imposed by dragons. Thus, like Richard Wright's poem, Mega, Mega pointed a finger at Jim Crow segregation. Mega pointed a finger at white supremacy. Mega pointed a finger at the senseless violence. Mega pointed a finger at the bombing of black churches. Mega pointed a finger at voter disenfranchisement. And lastly, Mega pointed a finger at those blacks and whites who were content and unwilling to make the, the world a better place for all children. So you begin to see how Richard Rice's poem, Between the World and Me, connects to the life of Meg Evans. Megar understood what was between the world and him, between the world and his family, between the world and his children. He understood the philosophies, the epistemologies of white supremacy and racism were still there, even though there weren't as many lynchings at that, at his, during his period. Segregation was still there. So if we look at Megger's life, what is Megger's statement to us? As is the statement of many others. Essentially what Megger is saying, what Fannie Lou, Fannie Lou Hamer is saying, what Ella Baker has said, what Malcolm X has said, if you give us a fair chance, we will help you better understand democracy. That's what we're saying. You give us a fair chance. We will help you understand the meaning, the true meaning of democracy, right? Because Thomas Jefferson didn't understand the true meaning of democracy, right? He had slaves. He had Sally Hemings. And he had many contradictions. Now, some will ask, well, why do we have to focus on this issue of race with regard to courses in the humanity, African-American literature, could be in history, sociology? Why are y'all so fixated on race? Why can't we all get along? What's this, what's this fixation y'all have on race? Well, some of us professors know. But the answer, and it came to me with the help of my, one of my colleagues, what's the answer? Well, the answer resides in the film Roots, based on Alice Haley. And what Chicken George, the character Chicken George, says to a confused Kuta Kente, you know what he says? You's in America now, boy. You's in America now, boy. And that's the same thing to all of us. You are in America. And you need to know and understand race. You 
need to understand. You need to understand it not only for your social economic subjectivity, you need to understand it for your psychological health. You do. And that's what we, as some professors at Meg Evans College, are attempting to give you. Now, there's one novel, and I'm, I may, I'm going to do this rather quickly. There's another novel that deals with this whole issue of democracy that I'm quite interested in. And I'm just going to talk about it. The novel is Ernest Gaines, A Lesson Before Dying. And this novel depicts a young man, Jefferson, who's in the wrong place at the wrong time, and is involved in a situation where a white man is murdered by two other blacks who are also killed in this novel. And Jefferson is sent sentenced to electric chair. During the trial, his def defense attorney, trying to save his life, talks about Jefferson as being illiterate and essentially a hog. And his godmother, Miss Emma, is traumatized by the fact that her grandchild is being labeled a hog. And she sees his dejected face when that pronouncement is made. And her desire is a simple one. He must not die thinking that he's a hog. And you, Grant Wiggins, the teacher, must help him understand that. But Grant is unwilling to do that. He's resistant. He doesn't want to go and help Jefferson. Why? Because as a teacher, he's going to be humiliated, debased in every attempt that he does to help this young man die with dignity. And he doesn't understand why. You see, these women, they understand why he needs to die with dignity. Because if he dies as a hog, it's a statement on the black community. These black women were smart enough to realize that that could not happen. And so both Grant and Jefferson go on this journey. They both go on a journey in terms of black male subjectivity. Because for Jefferson to be elevated to a position of dignity, the teacher has to become humiliated and made low. You understand? For him to rise, the teacher has to go low. And if you think about it, if you're trying to help somebody with offense, what do you have to do? You got to bend, right? You got to bend. You got to bend your knees if you want to help this person over that fence. And it's the same thing. And those of you who know this text should know Claude McKay the Jamaican writer, and his poem. And that's what Ernest Gaines is signifying on. In that poem, there's a line. If we must die, let it not be like hogs. So here, we got that intertextuality, that same intertextuality we had with Wright and the Bible, we have with Gaines. I want to read you a quote from A Lesson Before Dying that speaks to this whole issue of black male subjectivity in the journey. Grant says, we black men have failed to protect our women since the time of slavery. We stayed here in the South and are broken, or we run away and leave them alone to look after the children and themselves. So each time a male child is born, they hope he will be the one to change the vicious circle which he never does. Because even though he wants to change it, and maybe even tries to change it, it's too heavy a burden. Because all of the others who have run away and left their burden behind. So he too must run away if he's to hold on to his sanity and have a life of his own. They, the women and girls, look at their fathers, their grandfathers, their uncles, their brothers, all broken. They see me. I, who grew up on that same plantation, can teach. 
reading, writing, arithmetic, I can give them something that neither a husband or father nor a grandfather ever did. So they want to hold on to me as long as they can, not realizing that their holding on will break me too. That in order for me to know, to be what they think I am, what they want me to be, I must run away as the others have done. But these women, and especially if you read Ernest Gaines' work, you know that women play a very powerful role in all of his novels. Very powerful role. These women help Grant understand that it's not just a lesson before dying with regard to Jefferson, is that the teacher must learn a lesson before Jefferson dies. Now, the last point I want to make about this journey gets back into my book, The Tragic Black Buck, and some of the comments that Dr. Nunez said. What is important about this book, and I'm going to finish, I'm going to do this in three minutes. What's important about this book, not only did I deal with this issue of racial passing in terms of access, because the larger issue is blacks wanting access, democracy. What is important is that one of these novels, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, is giving is given a new look. And that's the important that this could not have happened in any place other than Mary Gavis Collins. I am the only scholar in the world who's making this argument about Jay Gatsby, that this character can be seen as a light-skinned black man passing for white. No other scholar has made that argument. And maybe the reason is because no other black scholar has taken the time to investigate this book, not just the book that you read, but also the facsimile that's also in the university. So my point is that there are texts or ideas out here that can be challenged by you, whether you're in law, whether you're in biology, whether you're in chemistry, whether you're in accounting. You can come in with your knowledge and intellect and change the world just like I did. And I did this in the context of teaching here at Megger. I didn't have this theory, this idea, when I left Columbia. It happened here at Megger Evers College. With that, I'm going to stop and end and encourage you that do not let the limited expectations of others dictate your life. That Megger is a powerful place to be and I hope you embrace your journey of intellectual empowerment. In the sanctuary of learning, minds and space merge in a tranquil setting. Glass, air, light, and space for intellects to grow that blossom seeds of knowledge, unfolding in a contemplative world of books, reading, and information, sturdy, steady, and strong creating success one student at a time. Maker Evers College, come and learn. Egypt, land of the pharaohs and magnificent splendor. Join Dr. Crawford's annual educational tour to Egypt from July 23rd to August 6, 2005. This trip includes a five-star luxury cruise up the Nile, luxury hotels, and shopping. Visit the Pyramid, Sphinx, the temples of Abel Simbel, Karnak, Luxor, Valley of the Kings, and much more. For more information, call 718-756-8904 or visit www.sancopaworldpublishers.com. Life is indeed a journey, but I believe it is a glorious journey. And you will come upon times when you will have to choose which road to take. You will be at a crossroad, a fork in the road. And I believe if you have paid attention to all the signposts on your road and remember the lessons others were put there to teach you, that you will take the road less traveled, not the easy road that everyone has already trod upon. But ah, what wonders 
to behold on that journey. It is in your hands. So I want to thank you for your attention this afternoon. I want to thank Dr. Thompson for his lecture. I also want to thank Jimmy for setting this up, the President's Office for asking me to participate, and my treasured colleague, Dr. Nunez. So walk in peace, and I'd like to close with a poem, as I so often do, if I can find it. This poem was written by the celebrated poet, Lucille Clifton, and it is entitled, Song at Midnight. And the epigraph reads, do not send me out among strangers. Brothers, this woman carries much sweetness in the folds of her flesh. Her hair is white with wonderful. She is rounder than the moon and far more faithful. Brothers, who will hold her if you do not? Who will find her beautiful if you don't? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come, celebrate with me that something has tried to kill me each day and has failed. Thank you.